What is up, theology nerds? This is Trip, and you are listening to the Homebrewed Christianity Podcast, where we bring you zesty, ideological ingredients so you can brew your own faith. And today on the podcast is Stephanie Crowder, the Associate Professor of Theological Field Education in the New Testament at Chicago Theological Seminary. And we are going to be talking about moms. Well, actually, we're going to talk about our book, When Mama Speaks. It is a book about uh, the Bible, motherhood, and uh, womanist uh, interpretations of Scripture. So if you're saying to yourself, I don't like what's a womanist interpretation of Scripture, this this book, kind of in a very short intro, sets up what uh, a, a womanist is, black feminist uh, understanding of theology. It takes it, then adds in the the element of motherhood, and then reads uh, theologically uh, stories um, from Bible of women who are moms and connects it with the stories of women today. Powerful book, great conversation. So you may as well get ready because it's going to go down. Yeah, and if you need a last minute Mother's Day gift. Mm-hmm. That's right, Nathan. Your mom, if she's like needs a good book, boom. There because it, it, unlike, you know, a lot of times when people are on the podcast, they write very large books with, that use language and details and stuff. No, this one, you have like the short kind of methodology stuff up front, but then it's just really creative uh, um, ex-Jesus stuff that Yeah, my mom accessible. doesn't have time for all that stuff. She just wants to get right to the point, you know? Well, you want to tell your mom hi, Nathan? Hi, Mom. She, uh, knows, she doesn't listen. But, uh, I don't even think she knows how what a podcast, podcast is. is. <laughs> <laughs> well, and for, for Mother's Day, you can all give her... <laughs> there you go. You can give your mother the gift of podcasting. Um, yeah, so before I jump in, a few things I wanted to say is, uh, one, one, you should come to Theology Beer Camp this summer. For two reasons. Well, two reasons. The first reason What's is... the first reason? It's going to be awesome. Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, because there's going to be, like, nerdy things that me and Peter Rollins will be doing. We have, like, wonderful craft beer. We have chaplains of fermentation that will be ordained. There's going to be so much beer. In a We're couple weeks. We're going to know what to do. We're going to be ordaining our chaplains of fermentation. It's going to be a, an online... Ordination service. Service, yeah. Mm-hmm. Then we have, um, we're going to have some fun games. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah, we don't want to give too much away. We, we but have Peter Rons will be singing very, karaoke. <laughs> There's some very uh, special uh, rituals that will happen. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I forgot about I the forgot rituals. I forgot about those, yeah. yeah. Oh, man. Yeah, the, and there's other stuff. It's so what was your second reason? The second reason is because now Trip is a doctor. Oh. So, like... If you thought it was going to be nerdy before, oh yeah, it's going to be even nerdier. There you go. This, the Doctor Fuller and Doctor Rollins are going to be presenting theology beer camp. Oh yes, I just defended my dissertation, and you know when you when you do it and don't suck, they call you doctor at the end. So, um, so you can you can come to beer camp and buy him a, something to celebrate. And no, they just come to beer camp. Yeah, because yeah. they're buying a ticket to that's come to true. beer that's camp. That's true. See that it, it's and all inclusive. All my student there loans, is. I have to start paying them back soon. So you gotta you gotta get a ticket. Yeah, just and we'll have cigars. And that's true. Ce- celebrate. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, there's uh, no reason not to come. There, that's a, well, I bet there's a couple legitimate reasons, but it's probably not the person that's listening. This is probably true too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah. yeah, the other thing I was going to say uh, before before you hop in is, one, if you're a member of the homebrewed community group and you're going to Wild Goose or you're a homebrewed person going to Wild Goose, then make sure you let us know. The Wild Goose Festival in July in North Carolina, it's like uh, camping with a bunch of uh, artsy, spiritual, justice types. There's going to be music. We'll do a live podcast. But if you're going and you want to make sure we all camp together, then you need to let us know. And the homebrewed little section. Yeah. A little tent. A city. contingent. Yeah. A contingent. And and I've someone asked on the on the on the Twitter, they were like, do, do you bring your families? Yes. Like my entire family's going. Mm-hmm. So all five of us will be there. So that, like you can't be like, oh no. And the kids actually really, really like it. Oh yeah. Wild Goose has basically the equivalent of progressive Christian VBS twice a day for kids. For the little uh, goslings. Uh-huh. So is you, that baby geese? I guess. Gooselings? Something. Goslings? Something. No, that's Ryan Gosling. Oh, my bad. Yeah, you're getting confused. No, I can't say whether or not he will be there. That's... <laughs> I can neither <laughs> confirm nor deny the presence of... <laughs> I think he's probably... He's just too handsome to camp. 
Mm. Well, there are um, air conditioned cabins that you can rent. Uh, you know. You know what I think? I do. You should camp. Yep. Camping is cool and fun. Oh, yeah. Um, and the last thing I was going to say uh, is coming up, if you're a member of the Homebrew Community Group, then, and that's the people that donate every month, they get a really sweet ecclesiastical title. Support the podcast. They're kind of like how the podcast continues to exist. If you're in that group, we have an epic reads coming up where we read something that's epic and then we discuss and talk about it. And we're going to be reading um, an, an essay by Bernard Loomer, who is a 20th century uh, process theologian on two different understandings of power, two types of power. It's a great, great work. And then I will uh, we'll get on our video group. We'll all get in there in the chit chats. I'll probably introduce it. Uh, and then we'll just start talking about it. Yeah. And there's there's no reason not to join. And this time we won't have to read, like, say, the entire City, city of God. God. <laughs> it's Look, a little bit shorter. Yeah. And But, you know, if you weren't in it then and you become a member, you can download mm-hmm. our, our stuff on the City of God. Yeah. So become a member because it's awesome. And well, you help support the podcast and get access to sweet things like hypocrites. There you go. Just go to homebrewcommunity.com. But, uh, yeah, so here's the thing. Here's the thing, nerds. This essay that you're going to read is awesome. But you're going to forget that I told you about it because the conversation you're about to hear is that good. Mm. If you want us. Uh-huh. So I hope you buckle your theological safety belts and you need to text your mom and tell her you love her because uh, you're about to uh, get your get your theological reflections from Mother's Day on right now. Mm. Even though the book has nothing to do with Mother's Day. It's just, it's about what Obama speaks. It was just well-timed that yeah. we did this interview. Yeah. No, we planned it a yeah. year out. What are you talking about? Since last Mother's That's Day. That's what I mean. We planned it. Yeah. We've been we've been reading lots of books to find the perfect book to do on Mother's Day. Absolutely. And it was this one. This one. And it's about to concress in somebody's headphones. That's a, that's a process. Word. Text that to your mom. Yeah. Mom. Uh, <laughs> all right. See you all next week. <laughs> Hello, Homebrewed Christianity listeners. This is Trip, and um, guess what? You all have a mom, and it, Mother's Day is coming up, and today we're going to be talking to Stephanie Crowder, who is a professor at Chicago Theological Seminary, and uh, she's the author of When Mother or Mama Speaks, uh, The Bible and Motherhood from a Womanist Perspective. It's a great book. It's uh, completely readable. If you are a nerd, you'll enjoy it because it won't require slow, multiple readings because it uses complete sentences that you don't need a graduate degree to read, but the ideas are profound and deep like you should get one. And then it engages biblical text, theological themes. You can read it with a group, by yourself. And uh, if you are a preacher who is sitting there going, I need to figure out how to preach more uh, stories that connect with the lived experience of, of mothers in the congregation and in our community, then this book is like cheating. Like there's just – like there, each chapter – and part two of the book goes to a different biblical text. It unpacks it in a powerful way, connecting it to the lived experience of people today. So I just want you to know in advance, if this is not your favorite episode in a long time, it's because I failed because the book doesn't. So thank you so much for joining the podcast. Thank you. It's great to be here. Oh, I'm, I've been uh, looking forward to this. And, you know, maybe maybe before jumping into kind of the book itself, um, you, you could share a little bit with us about how it was you came to be uh, both uh, a professor in, in biblical studies, uh, mm. a, a lady preacher, as you say in the uh, <laughs> uh, in the introduction of the book, and and someone who comes to a place to writing a text like this that is connecting so many different parts of their life and community. Sure, I um, I, I for me, who I am as a scholar is so much intertwined with. Um, who I am as a mother. And so mm-hmm. one of my favorite stories to tell is that on December 1st, I uh, submitted my final draft um, of my dissertation, December 1st, 1999. And on December 2nd, 1999, I gave birth to our first son. Um, so who I am as a mom has always been in partnership and collaboration. It's walk hand in hand with who I am um, as a scholar, as someone in the academy um, but this book really came about because, yes, as a, quote, lady preacher, you know, you're supposed to preach when Women's Day. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, you're supposed to preach Mother's Day. Um, and so I was very intentional early on about 
preaching about women in the biblical text uh, because we, we didn't hear about women. Of course, you know, around Advent, you, we, we, you got to talk about Mary. And every now and then you'd hear something about Elizabeth. Um, but no one was really talking about, you know, Rispa. We'd hear about Bathsheba as a, the sort of victim or sometimes vixen, but never about Bathsheba as um, negotiating the throne. So I always wanted to lift women of the biblical text and then particularly mothers um, when it came to Mother's Day. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's how really all of this got started. Um, one day I, I was preaching at a, a prayer breakfast for women and the coordinator came to me and she said, well, you know, what resources do you have? We have a lot of single mothers who are in dire need of resources. And although I had never been shy about hiding who I was, I'd never been shy about um, skirting around my own uh, being, my own uh, sense of being a mom. And I'd always made sure that my classes were around my children's um being able to drop them to school, but that my classes were around their academic um, classes as well, but I didn't have anything. And so she really sort of just stopped me in my tracks. And so I began to say, well, then what do, what would this mean to have a resource, a quick, readily available resource that, you know, a single mom, you know, who's working or, you know, someone who's married and who just needs something, or you're right, the lady pastor, lady mm-hmm. preacher who's just looking for a quick resource that talks about women in the Bible um, and mothers or, you know, for spouses who are trying to figure out, you know, we've, we've now entered into, you know, parenthood. What can I give to help, you know, um, the mom in, in my life? Mm-hmm. I mean, so that's how I'll start it. I mean, I, w- I would say that especially for uh, men who like the idea of preaching um, about female characters in scripture and then are uneasy because, well, you have the experience of actually not being a female or a mom, um, that, that the, the, the book actually gives a really good model because on top of looking at things that shape many different women's lives today, mm-hmm. it also get, it lets the life and narrative of women in scripture, uh, lead the way. And I think that is a, a, a helpful model that anyone that wrestles with the text and the lives and the experience of the different characters in scripture that, that you look on gives us a way of kind of speaking without kind of uh, feeling like you're overstepping your bounds. Well, I mean, that was the whole point. How do you take figures that in some regards are 4,000 years removed, or if you're looking at New Testament figures, 2,000 years removed, and make them live in 2017? Mm-hmm. So, yes, how do you take the story of, you know, Arispa, who in many ways hovers and protects and guards these dead bodies, these impaled Boys, you know, how does, how do you take that story that is such a heavy story, a hard story and what she risked? She risked her own life to keep these boys from being eaten and being destroyed by the elements. And how does her sort of die in, if you will, change the national landscape, get David's attention? Well, hey, here we go. Let's talk about, you know, Trayvon Martin. Let's talk about Jordan Davis. Well, let's talk about Jordan Edwards just, you know, a couple of days ago. And to think about these mothers of the movement, the mother of Sandra Bland, you know, Gloria Ville Reed, you know, the uh, Samaria Rice. Um, think about Lucia Macbeth, these mothers of the movement and the way in which they've had to sort of publicly mourn and publicly cover their dead sons, their dead daughters' lives. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think there are some biblical parallels. And what do we learn from this but and helping us to understand what these current day mothers have been experiencing, who've had to to mourn and to grieve so publicly about the tragedy of their own daughters and their own sons. Mm -hmm. Now, for for people that have just not read 2 Samuel recently, (laughs) and they're like, Arispa, is that that in a different sacred text? No, um, can can you give us a little bit about the story of Arispa in uh, 2 Samuel? So Rispa was really um, one of Saul's, you know, concubines. So mm-hmm. before David, there was Saul. Israel wanted a king, and so there was Saul. They had to have, so they chose Saul, and then later there was David. Well, there were some issues with Saul and the Gibeonites. It had not been resolved. And so David was trying to figure out, after Saul's death, David is trying to figure out why is there famine in the land, Why is it that things are just not going well with his new reign? 
Well, it comes to his attention that these Gibeonites are still PO'd by something Saul did. And they basically want blood for blood. And so David chooses uh, some of Rizpah's children. He chooses also um, sons from another one of Saul's concubines and has them hanged, you know, to pay the price, to be this kind of atonement, if you will, for what Saul did or did not rectify with the Gibeonites. And so Rizpah decides, well, here she takes their seven sons, whose body are ba- bodies are basically left for the elements, you know, for the beast of the wild air, if you will. But she hovers over them. She sacrifices her body as a way to bring attention to what she feels is public and national and, yes, maternal disgrace. Um, it comes to David's attention that Rispa has been sacrificing herself um, for these these bodies, So David, in regards, ends up burying not only these bodies, but goes back even to get the bodies of Saul and Jonathan to make amends and apologizes to the Gibeonites for what he's done, make amends to Rizpah. So this is supposed to make everything better. And by the way, oh, rain comes down (laughs) to nurture the ground. So it's a wonderful kind of a, you know, um, ecological, theological, and maternal kind of narrative, if you will. Mm-hmm. So in the first part of the book, you describe the uh, kind of womanist hermeneutic and mm-hmm. develop the concept of, of a, a womanist and maternal hermeneutic. Mm-hmm. Uh, th- to take into these texts so that yeah. it, they're not just about the lived experience of the silenced and forgotten women in our sacred texts, but they become places for us to acknowledge, wrestle, and attend to the the, the experience of women today that are dismissed. And it, maybe maybe you could begin there, like describe to us if you know if you aren't familiar with. Uh, mm-hmm. womanist theology or, or kind of uh, looking at lived experience for hermeneutics. If for some reason they skipped the Monica Coleman episode two weeks ago <laughs> sure. and, and didn't listen, um, w- w- introduce us to kind of the, the looking at uh, womanist uh, theology and, and motherhood as a hermeneutic uh, kind of opening uh, for engaging the text. Sure. So the, the idea that womanist, you know, comes from, you know, Alice Walker. So Alice Walker in the late seventies, really early eighties, sort of coined the phrase womanist. And she sort of plays on the word womanish as if you're acting womanish, acting, you know, girlish. And it, it was her way of appropriating the experiences of black women in many ways over against white women. Um, and so for Walker, it became this kind of color commentary, you know, sort of like, you know, feminist is to womanish as lavender is to purple. Mm -hmm. Not saying that one is better, but one is different. You know, one is not deficient, but it is distinctive over against the other. And so you had then towards the the late 80s, early 90s, where within theological context, it became womanism, Mm -hmm. um, this kind of hermeneutical approach, this mode of interpretation that takes into account race, um, class, and gender. And so the critique with womanism was that, well, feminism was quite, you know, well astounded in addressing of gender, and it would also address maybe class on occasion, but the race piece would get dropped and the class piece wasn't highlighted so much. Mm-hmm. So womanism tends to take this sort of tripartite approach where you have to talk about, you know, what women are experiencing. You have to talk about class distinctions. You have to talk about what it is that makes black women's um, stories and black women's experiences different. I add a fourth layer to that in talking about um, which motherhood. Mm-hmm. And so not only do we have to sort of traverse classism and, and, and deal with racism and also deal with sexism, but if you view those three elements through the lens of motherhood, then what does that mean um, for black mothers? So then how do we talk about, yes, uh, mothers of the movement? How do we talk about Frances Ellen Wachenhoffers? And how do we talk about Ida B. Wells, who was also a mother? How do we talk about Jerena Lee as she's dealing with her own call to ministry and having to leave her children behind and wrestle with AME officials 
and trying to live out her call. Mm-hmm. So it's not just um, race, it's, it's race, class, and gender through the dynamics, through the window of what does it mean to be a mother and this kind of maternal instinct. Mm-hmm. So in the, in the book itself, you, you unpack the, the narrative um, and, and look at the relationship, uh, you, you kind of describe the Ritzba factor in, mm-hmm. in the book. Mm-hmm. And in, in it, you said, uh, this, that, and it was, I thought, rather straightforward and powerful. You said that the Ritzba factor displays itself in a sundry of ways. Just as a king determined the fate of this biblical mother, current day political structures can dictate the livelihood of African American women and their children. These mothers face many challenges that give rise to their watching over the bodies of the deceased sons and daughters. Um, you know, I can imagine being in a situation where um, short of introducing a lot of those of those topics and structural injustices into into the sermon, short of connecting it to the biblical text, a lot of people, I think, would resist hearing it, right? Like that the the lived experience piece becomes threatening when the lived experience isn't of someone who's just trying to become a nicer person so they can get a better job or do better Mm -hmm. in school so that they can get the career they want or be more respectful to whoever the people above them are and in this type of thing. And, and in a sense, if that's the only lived experience that ever makes it in a pulpit, then there's not many humans that really can fit in a church. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and I wonder as a as someone who not just introduced text but helps people think through the act of preaching and using the text how where do you go in in making fruitful connections to keep ears open when connecting lived experience with the experience of these women in scripture well i think number 1 people don't leave their identity when they come into a, a religious setting mm-hmm. you know, whether it's a temple a mosque or a synagogue we don't leave our own sort of ontology at the door. You know, we don't leave our identity, our sense of being. It doesn't stay in the parking lot. Um, we, we, we bring what is, whatever has happened to us, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, all of that walk side by side soon as we come into this religious setting. And so we can't divorce or we can't desiccate, you know, what's happening in the political world or what's happening just in our own personal lives. I think when people come, you know, like I'll say from my own Christian experience, when they come to church, they are looking, you know, to, for the preacher to say, thus saith the Lord about my particular predicament. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I'm wrestling with, with job loss. I'm wrestling with a child on drugs. You know, I'm trying to figure out, well, my candidate didn't get elected to the White House. And <laughs> what is that going to mean for me? You know, there are all these executive orders, you know, that happen at midnight at, you know, I have friends who are Muslim and, you know, what's going to happen to them? So I think people are looking for ways in which sacred texts speak to their current day identity. Um, they want to know that, you know, this divine being that their creator still is still active, is still involved, is still concerned that that, that they don't serve. And they don't worship this kind of removed, distant, um, divine being that, you know, their belief is rooted in, in something, someone who is going to act, who has compassion and who cares. And so I think for many people, it is a matter of how does this live here and now? How do we uh, make these applications um, to their current day lives? People want to know, you know, yes, that's biblical text, but. You know, what is it going to do for me right here, right now, 2017? What has the Lord done for me lately? <laughs> what is mm-hmm. the Lord going to do um, for me lately? Uh, I think it's it's, it's prophetic ministry um, in yeah. many regards. One of the things I found extremely helpful about that 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 chapter, and the more honest we are about our place in the world that we're in, mm-hmm. is it um, that is it her prophetic act was really being faithful to the very, like to the love she has for people, but also it wasn't even her own, right? Like yeah. the, it, what she was doing was being a mother for those who weren't, didn't have someone being a mother for them. Right. And in doing so raises the conscience and awareness around this, uh, around this issue that the system and those in power would have just like left un, undone. 
And right. that's a very different call than, right, like feeling obligated as an, as an activist or as a Christian to have the solutions to everything or to know how to fix it. Like mm-hmm. the, the, the risk factor is like this, like, no, like maybe that's, we, we aren't responsible for fixing everything, but we can be responsible to this situation mm-hmm. with this motherly care. And here's mm-hmm. one way of what it looks like. Absolutely. I mean, I'll give you the story. I mean, the, the word on the street is that, you know, um, after Michael Brown's murder, you know, that whole movement started. It was, it wasn't really Leslie McSpadden, who's his mother who started, mm-hmm. but it was people who saw a larger communal issue in Ferguson that said, wait a minute, we've got to, you know, lift up this clarion call. We've got to sound the trumpet about what's happening with, with black men and with black women as it relates to brutality. What's happening with our Latino brothers and sisters? How does class play a role in this, you know, whether you're black or, or white or Latino? So there were many people who were not mothers, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? But who were concerned about the plight of this particular mother's child. And so here is Rispa, you know, there were seven who were impaled. Only two belonged to her. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yet there was a larger national issue um, at stake here. And so for, you know, people who've been a part of, you know, Black Lives Matter or just any movement, oftentimes it's not so much that they've been personally affected, but in many regards, what's the larger picture here? You know, what's the larger communal issue? What's the larger society and cultural issue and political matter that we have to um, that we have to address? Um, what's the human factor? You know, so yeah. I think that becomes of it that, you know, care, compassion, love. Th- there are no limits there. there. There's a human factor that when we see, you know, injustice, when we see wrongdoing, what in us says that, yes, th- this happened to a black male, this happened to a Latina woman. I'm not either of those, but there's a human factor that connects us all, that calls me, that stirs me into action. How would you describe uh, then, then David as a sense, as a model for the minimal response? <laughs> right? Like he had to get provoked. He, uh, I bet at first he said all sorts of things that, that people across this country have said at, at the rise of protest movements and resistance and things, mm-hmm. as, and and they dismiss the experience. They mm-hmm. go mm-hmm. into the details of one story just to dismiss it, or they find some picture of someone stealing something and go to dismiss it. And that and that there was a sense that for David, the the mother's grief for even people that weren't her own mothers broke the facade, mm-hmm. and then he was able to acknowledge reality and do something. And I wonder if like the other side of the story is. Uh, a, a call for people of privilege to listen and let the tears and cries and wailing of mothers break through the privilege that we just continue to justify and then avoid ever trying to act responsibly or using our, our place and stuff to, to, to really begin to reconcile, which is what, you know, he moves towards like acknowledging reality. Mm-hmm. Well, I think the first point is that people have to acknowledge their own privilege. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, so oftentimes, you know, we turned, you know, a deaf ear, a blind eye, we lift a stammering tongue to privilege. Um, cause either we're just oblivious to it, or for some people, they're, they're ashamed of it. And so I think if we, you want to talk about David, yeah, David has his issues, of course, you know, as noted in the biblical narrative. But I think in many ways, David realizes that there's some power that he wills in this regard. I mean, you're a king. And so you had, David had you know, the opportunity, the power to sort of change the national landscape, to change the dynamic here. I think also David realized, well, wait a minute, for the sake of moving forward and for the sake of relationships with other nations, this needs to be rectified. A second, for the sake of closure, um, David, you know, it has much bloodshed. You know, it's a very military, a very brutal kind of reign that he has. And so much so that God even tells David, you know, I don't think you're going to be the one to build the temple. There's too much blood on your hand. Um, but I think in that moment, as dealing with Rispa, David realizes his privilege, acknowledges his power, uses that privilege, uses that power to make national change. Yes, it takes a woman with a die-in to get David's attention but yet she gets David's attention. He acknowledges what he can do and what changes he can make that would in many ways change the landscape of his people. And I think that's what a responsible leader does. Mm-hmm. Looks at the larger picture, 
does not sort of dwell in his or her own personal interests, but says, for the good of my country, for the good of my people, if I'm going to be a good steward of those under my care, then this is what is necessary to move the people forward, to move this nation forward. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, maybe, maybe we could talk a bit about the, the Bathsheba passage since it stays uh, in in the larger uh, narrative in, in Samuel. Um, and and I know that a lot those that are familiar with kind of the the, the way in which the Bathsheba story has been explored in mm-hmm. feminist literature will look at the the power dynamic in the relationship when it begins um, when David sees her and takes her and in, in, in that part um, and not that that's not a part of the story but I found the the way you you looked at how she used her agency and mm-hmm. advocacy a real powerful um, a, a real powerful way of of giving Bathsheba back. Uh, agency in a story where so often she's seen as as uh, just a victim. Right. I, I wanted to lift this story because it's not discussed. It's not preached about. You know, it's hard. It hardly is. Uh, we again, we tend to talk about Bathsheba as either the vixen, which is always surprising to me, her being the vixen, or Bathsheba being um, the victim. Um, but I think this is a great story of redemption. Mm-hmm. You know, it's almost, you know, 20 years later, we, we're thinking, and here Bathsheba so reemerges. David is on his deathbed. He has this, this, this young, you know, pretty, I don't know, um, I don't know, she's not a concubine, but bed warmer, Abishag, who's there keeping David warm. And it's very interesting. Nathan, the prophet, comes to Bathsheba and says, well, you do know that David's son, Adonijah, is just really kind of taken over his self, has proclaimed himself as king. And the dynamic between Bathsheba and Nathan are, is quite interesting because here's Nathan. He's been the prophet all along. And yet he doesn't feel that he has the courage or that he has, you know, David's ear anymore. So he devises this plan and says, well, Bathsheba, you go in and tell him that Adonijah is up to no good. He's planning this overthrow. He's even, even aligned military folk and cultic leaders on his side. Bathsheba goes in, and it's interesting how she plays this man's game. She's very politically savvy. You know, she does obeisance, obeisance to David. She pays him homage, my lord, the king, and, you know, oh, you're great, you're wonderful. But she also reminds him that, well, you promised that Solomon would be on the throne. Now, there's really not anywhere in the biblical record where David makes this promise to Solomon. God and David have this conversation, uh, but it's not that God and Bathsheba have this conversation. But the Bathsheba is very politically savvy. She's very astute to this kind of patriarchal way of doing things. So she goes in, pays obeisance, lets David know what's going on. Nathan comes to confirm or to co-sign on her story. And eventually David acts. And so he killed, you know, Adonijah, and at least Adonijah's people, they end up dead. That's, uh, Solomon takes the throne. And you'll notice that in First Kings second chapter, who's sitting at um, Solomon's right hand side? It's his mother Bathsheba. You know, she becomes the queen mother. Mm-hmm. So this is a wonderful story of, of redemption of, of, you know, how Bathsheba becomes fearless. She's not, you know, the little victim or vixen that we previously saw. But she's a, what I call a strong, grown woman now. She's seen some things. She's heard some things. She knows how this works. And she's fearless and fierce about even using her own power and even coaxing David because she tells David that, you know, all of Israel is watching you. Um, so they're expecting you to leave. So what are you going to do? How mm-hmm. are you going to leave us? Yeah, I I, I found in you know i'm i'm not a female or i am mean, not black female at all uh but it, it, in in the way you wrestled with the text you you emphasize that that you know mothers have the ability to rewrite their stories and i think mm-hmm. that's that's one of the elements of grace is that we can rewrite our stories mm-hmm. in the in the challenge of the text for me was the way in which she rewrote her story, but it, part of it was attending to to the system. The, uh, the she had this kind of prowess around uh, the way power worked. Uh, she used the rhetoric and this type of stuff, but she used it with a wisdom um, that was connected to the well being of others. Right? Like yeah. it wasn't like you're just rewriting your own story where you remained at the center, but she did it in a way that lifted her son up. Right. So Bathsheba says, well, number one, David, Israel is looking for you to lead. What are you going to do? 
So there is natural, na- national interest that's at stake here. Um, Bathsheba is very clear that, well, okay, unless you do something, then Solomon and I will be deemed offenders, which means that if Adonijah reigns, if the people continue to, if he continues in this vein, we could end up getting killed because people will think that we are traitors. And so we'll be accused of treason. So basically we could be out on the street. And I think third, yes, there's a personal interest. You know, David and Bathsheba apparently still have this relationship. And I think Nathan realizes that because Nathan says, well, Bathsheba, you go in. And even as Nathan is talking to David, David even says, call Bathsheba back in. Well, there's a literary gap because we, we're really not sure that Bathsheba ever left David's presence. But there's this kind of personal relationship that she and David, you know, have, you know, perhaps, I don't know, he's, there's still booze, if you will. There's still mm-hmm. this kind of love thing um, that they have going for them. And so, yes, there's national interest, there's familial interest, and there's personal interest. And yeah, Bathsheba, as far as we know, that's her only child. It's, it's Solomon. And so she is concerned about, you know, the well-being, uh, the legacy of her son. Um, Adonijah has not done this properly. And she wants to make sure that all the I's are dotted, that all the political T's are crossed. Um, mm-hmm. And she's not ready to be out of the street, and she doesn't want her son to be without as well. Um, so she's very clear of, of the game. I think she's seen how this kind of patrilineal society works. Mm-hmm. And she she plays a main man's game for the sake, you know, of another man. Yeah, and that's her son. You, you in the in the book you're talking about the Bathsheba effect and you tell a number of different stories. Uh mm-hmm. I mean is there one that sticks out the the most to you as a way of kind of capturing how the what the text evokes for us in our own context? You know, uh, Ursula Burns' story, I mean, as one of the first African Americans to uh, women to lead um a Fortune 500 company, you know, Xerox. And um, I also watched her recently on the Black Enterprise Women in Power Summit, and she talked about what it meant to be, you know, a mother. You know, so here's somebody dealing with billion-dollar company, um, but even admitting in the article that I referenced where she says, you know, sometimes some balls will get dropped. You know, she's had to miss a couple of games or a couple of events, uh, but yet she tried to be intentional in being there for you know, her children. Um, she talked about that, you know, the whole family had to move to London and she was really concerned about that, you know, as a mom, you know, would her children adjust to that and what would happen to them? But she was like, as long as they had sports and friends, they were okay. Um, so here's a woman, you know, navigating billions of dollars, but saying that sometimes there's a struggle, you know, with career and family and motherhood and just being open and honest about that. Having to navigate, you know, yeah, in a man's world, you know, not so many African-American women or some of the women, period, who are head of Fortune 500 companies and trying to make sure that being a mother is not a deficit, but it's a plus mm-hmm. uh, that it adds to her ability to multitask and to schedule and, and, and to balance. Yeah, she's juggling every now and then a ball gets dropped, but you wake up the next day or you take the next moment and you continue to try to juggle. Um, so I wanted to lift her um, as an example of this kind of fearless woman, this fearless mother who's wrestling with ways in which, yeah, we, we are forced to juggle in a man's world, if you will, motherhood and that sense of calling, yes, to be um, in a workplace, but also that sense of calling to be in the home place as well. Mm-hmm. How How do you think the... The, the way in which I would imagine different families and different generations and different parts of the country are in, in cultures where the kind of uh, historic kind of role of a mom in the home or whatever uh, is, is shifting where, you know, in different parts of the country, there's expectations that, that um, both partners in a home will be playing roles. There's also a, the, how that the role of nurturing changes in a single parent home, be it a single dad or a single mom, um, and in that the the arrangement and types and expressions of family with different cultural expectations, it seems to be in a lot of flux, and so a lot of ministers I think are tenuous to deal with these texts because there is no essentialized family or the American family, and so how do you kind of 
how do you how do you advise ministers to take these texts to bring it up, but then also pass the the you know, like the torch to nur- nurturing and caring for others, or to mm-hmm. say no to opportunities to tend to the opportunity of your child or whatever is a is a challenge or call for you know everyone regardless of how a particular family is uh, built. Well, I think there are two ways. Number one, I think family is ministry. Mm-hmm. And so I think we have to broach it that way. Uh, I'm a minister. My husband's a pastor. And so there are quite a number of times where we're having to juggle, okay, I'm preaching today. You're preaching today. What do we do? You know, who goes where? And usually one child goes with him. One child goes with me. Sometimes if I'm going out of town, there are different arrangements. So I think we have to realize that our first ministry is to our family. Mm-hmm. Um, that, that's our, our first calling. How do we make sure that our children are cared for? How do we make sure that our marriage is, is taken care of? It's not always easy, but we have to have that awareness, that recognition that that's our first point of ministry. I think secondly, um, and I say in the book that I don't get into this, you know, stay at home mom versus, you know, a mom who works outside of the home, you know, for, I add another leg and saying work is work is work. <laughs> whether you, you work from home, whether you work from an office that's, you know, 20 or 30 miles away, work is work is work. And basically to each, you know, his or her own, um, whatever works in your family, then work that. Um, and, and sometimes what's working needs to be revamped, retooled and, and, and tweaked on, on many levels. Um, so I think we have to, Stop bifurcating and stop, you know, choosing sides over whether it's stay at home or those who work outside of the home. Because the bottom line is that, you know, for many of us, you know, if we, if we work outside of the home, we tend to send our kids to child care. Well, there's a mother there at the daycare who's tending to our children. Mm-hmm. And we have to ask ourselves, well, what did that mother at the daycare who's tending to our children well, who's taking care of her children while she's tending to our children? So there's this kind of, you know, Mbutu effect that, you know, I'm a, gr- a good mother as you are a good mother, mm-hmm. that we're all connected and we're all tied into this. And so I think it's listening, you know, this idea that ministry, our family is ministry, and this idea that we, we all need each other, um, that, you know, if I'm working in the academy, I have to be concerned about my colleagues and, and you know, male and female who, who are nurturing. But I have to also be concerned about those who are cleaning, you know, and how are we being good stewards and being good and, com- and being in community um, with those who are helping us uh, to do the work. Uh, so I think that's what a class awareness does, um, that we ought to be concerned and, ha- and show compassion um, and fight uh, for, for all of us. Mm-hmm. When you're... Um when so so you're saying your your husband is he in the same church every week and and because of your position you're you travel a lot and will be right. guest preaching in different places yeah absolutely absolutely i mean he he's the pastor and uh, i'm not and so i could easily be gone on mm-hmm. two let's say two weekends out of a month um you know either in the city or outside of the city preaching and mm-hmm. it's having to to navigate um, you know, who's going to do what, you know, with a child? Are they going to go with you? Are they going to come with me? Or how is that going to work? Um, so it's, it's negotiation, but it is rooted in that family ministry. That's, that's what holds it all, mm-hmm. all together. That it, at the end of the day, checking in with our children, making sure that they're okay, that the marriage is okay. And yeah, every now and then you have to miss a game or you have to miss an appointment, but try to make sure that that doesn't become the pattern. Uh, but also may mean saying no mm-hmm. uh, because, oh, a birthday, <laughs> you know, or a big game is that day. No, sorry, can't do it. So absolutely. My uh, my wife and I are both ordained ministers. Mm-hmm. And um, about a year and a half ago or almost two years now when I started teaching full time was the first time since we were 18 that neither one of us worked full time at a church. Mm-hmm. And so we've started going to a church together as just members. And I, I, I mean, when you go as a minister or when I was a minister's spouse, mm-hmm. uh, it, that's a very different experience. Sure. I want to, I, I was surprised because I've heard people complain about church, but I just know 
that I have as a family it is one of my favorite things of the week. You come. <laughs> there's other adults that you are not having to do anything to make money with mm-hmm. or do, there's no expectations. You mm-hmm. all confess your sins together and everyone <laughs> you realize that everyone is as screwed up as you. People sure. attempt to tell a story about love and compassion and God to your children, communal singing, and then uh, there's coffee that doesn't taste bad. I, <laughs> I, 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 I was like, wow, church is... This use it's not nearly as a uh, as diff uh, as bad as it used to be. Um, it's stressful, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and and so like it's been this uh, experience of kind of um, uh, you know, as we've been doing that, I've also been getting lots of uh, having lots of conversations with friends who are entering parenthood. We had uh, our first is nine, so mm-hmm. of our of our friends, we had kids first, and mm-hmm. so. We we've had this experience of of friends that may have had off and on relationship with congregations or are now having children and they grew up in a context where there are certain kind of central Christian convictions they've left behind, be it mm-hmm. a real kind of uh, escapist version of salvation or or that their faith community wasn't attending to justice or care for the poor or accepting and welcoming of the outcasts and stuff like that and. And I think a lot of families continue are trying to figure out then, well, what are the patterns, communities, and places you go to pass on the faith in in life giving ways where we aren't going to get a call from our kid in college, realizing yeah. that uh, they had to get a therapist and get rid of half of what they picked yeah. up in Sunday school. <laughs> so I mean, do, do you like one of the things about like attending to more and more of our of our lived experience and how it complicates these certitudes that a lot of us felt like we were handed early on mm. religiously is that now our faith doesn't have our we don't have a community that gives space for our the fullness of our lived experience mm. and mm. but yet we want to hand on the treasure and community of faith to our to our children uh, does that make sense that i yeah, i get yeah, asked yeah. that in so many different ways sure. and um and I think that when people start becoming children again, they realize, yeah, I couldn't get to where I am without that really bad sermon about that mm-hmm. story. Now, I hope they don't have to interpret it through penal substitutionary <laughs> atonement again, but like there still was something going on in the, in, in a community of faith that I wouldn't want to sin to be a part of anymore. Sure. Yeah. So I, you know, I think in many ways it's, it's this kind of open communication, um, because, you know, working at Chicago Theological Seminary, I mean, yeah, we, we are UCC affiliated, but we have Hindu students, Muslim students. Mm-hmm. And um, a couple of years ago, we had a conference and my teenager volunteered at this conference. And more than anything that appealed to him, he had a wonderful conversation with one of my Muslim colleagues about hip hop. <laughs> and so here's my Christian son, you know, has grown up going to church mom a minister, dad a pastor. And so knowing what all of that means, but even to this day will ask me, how is Dr. Nashashidi doing? Because mm-hmm. they made this connection over hip hop. And so I said, well, that's what it took, you know, for him to sort of talk about his own questions and, you know, to have this engagement about a culture that I'm, I'm still learning about, then so be it. So I think those are ways, I think we, as parents, we have to be willing for them to take the risk and to have these kind of open uh, conversations. I think exposure is so important mm-hmm. um, that, you know, that we don't just try to shut the questions down as it relates to different religious traditions, but that we begin to talk about, you know, how it is that what we, we believe is different or in some ty- and sometimes similar to what people in other faith traditions believe. So I think exposure and just opportunities to have these kind of painful conversations um, and just making sure that, yeah, when they're on those those phones and all those other electronic devices, that we, we're gauging what they're doing and having some dialogue about larger, you know, sort of world events and, and, and changes that are happening um, with them. So I think... Um, it's, it's our, our, as parents, being willing to take the risk and also to extend and expand what we mean by community. Mm-hmm. Uh, and how do we create our own sense of community um, as, as well? So when you think of um, the, the way in which the book you're wrestling with these biblical texts and then 
you give really good examples of c- kind of contemporary places that text can come alive. Mm-hmm. As when you go in the pulpit or when you're teaching students about this, like how do you advise or guide them in thinking about sharing their own experience connected to the, the text and their experience as a parent um, and uh, or, or their race, their class, gender, and that kind mm-hmm. of thing? Sure. At what point are those elements a constructive contribution? And what are times and places where they can distract or kind of not assist in communicating the um, the challenge of the text? Sure. I think that's a great question. I think number one, I start with, so I was doing this Bible study with a group of women in our church just this Sunday. And um, I told them after we had gone through this exercise that I always start with looking in the mirror. I always start with social location, social identity. That I think we have to start with who we are, who are the people, what are the places, what are the experience, what are the events, you know, the religious traditions, our our own sort of geographical background, political ideology. What are those kind of social locators that have shaped, informed, and continue to mold who we are and how we we deal with people? Oftentimes, we can easily um, articulate what those factors are. But there are many times when those factors are are hidden. They're mm-hmm. sort of hidden figures, if you will. Yeah. Uh, and so I, I tell people that before we begin interpreting, you know, any biblical text, we always have to examine what it is that we're bringing to the table. Um, because sometimes we have an MO and we're not even aware of that MO. Sometimes we are. We're very clear. But there are many times when we are reading and interpreting texts, when we're reading and interpreting people trip yeah. that, you know, we, we're not even aware of our own issues, our own idiosyncrasies, our own stories, our own journeys. And so I think that before we interpret the biblical text, we pro- before we have any sort of hermeneutical access, that we have to exegete ourselves, mm-hmm. if you will, um, that we have to be honest about our own journeys. We have to be open and honest about our own, I guess, for lack of an academic word, our own stuff. Um, so that's one thing that I said that we, we have to begin with self identification. I'm pretty um, sure a t shirt that says exegete yourself would be, uh, <laughs> it would be a div school popular shirt. <laughs> yeah, so there you go. I'll keep that in mind. But I, it has to start with, with us uh, because there's so much, um, you know, when we are reading texts that. You know, I, I may read some, we can each read John 316, but you're going to get something out of it. I won't because we're sitting in different places and we've had different paths and we've taken different trajectories. Um, so we start with our own sense of, of identity. And I think if, if pastors and preachers and, and teachers, um, lay leaders would just be open and honest about, you know, why it is we do what we do or trying to get in touch with who it is that's doing this. Um, show our hands, basically. I think that that's a good point of uh, of beginning and in the kind of hermeneutical process. Um, and I think then it's also important to be honest and say, but everybody's experiences are different. And mm-hmm. it's not that they're deficient, but they are different. Yeah, it can be problematic when we get into interpretations and readings that dehumanize, uh, that demean and defame, that keep people from living into their, their full humanity. Then we, yes, as a community, we have to call into question those interpretations and those readings. Um, but if it's, if it's about justice and love and compassion and the P, the freedom for people to grow and to be, then I think we have to leave those on the table so that we can all move forward. And we may not agree, um, with the readings, but at least there could be some honest discussion that they come from, you know, a good, clean, wholesome, um, unifying place, if you will. Mm-hmm. So when, when you're thinking of the, the challenges raised by like gender, race, and class in the American mm-hmm. church and mm-hmm. what it means, like it seems extremely complicated and that even for the church to work out these issues, like mm-hmm. uh, my family are, are very Southern and very white. And I know that like I was, regardless of their intentions and regardless of how much my parents worked on were you know leaders in racial reconciliation movement that racism is just a part of our culture that sits there it's a part of our history i need to always be thinking and wrestling with it and and dealing with it and i know that that's something that uh 
the church also is constantly dealing with. And I think a lot of, of a lot, a lot of people, and I, and I've, I had a conversation the other day at one of our, um, minister gatherings for the South Bay in LA. And you, you had multiple different races of ministers there who all had the same problem. Like, oh, should our churches be, you know, multicultural? Oh, some, well, well, I don't know if that would work. Some people are mature enough for it. Some aren't. Oh, but some of us enjoy the cultural specificities of our traditions and others don't. And, um, and then, you know, I, my comment was like, yeah, I, I, I understand all this, but then as just a parent, um, like I would like, my children's experience of the church to be more diverse and richer than mine. Mm-hmm. And yet I don't want to be invading space or, or, or whatever. So it, it, when you're thinking of like both as a theologian at the macro level of the church, you know, across the country, but always all the way down to just as a parent, what are some, what are, what's your advice on wrestling with the way in which we locate ourselves just by going to particular congregations, uh, knowing just how much, uh, that will always be in the mirror when they look there, right? Like when you begin with the, how do you exegete yourself? Sure. Um, it'll be, well, you know what? 5,000 hours of communal exegesis have been in a room where only 20% weren't white. And that, that can't not affect things, you know, like, mm-hmm. And I don't, and I don't know what it means to be a parent with integrity in that situation. Sure. I mean, you know, we, we, we choose our our religious communities for the reasons we choose our religious communities. Mm -hmm. You know, some of it has to do with, you know, if, if you work in an environment where you, you are the, the minority, you, you don't want that replicated (laughs) when you go, you know, to church or to your synagogue or your mosque or, or, or your temple. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so for some, it becomes this kind of way of racial ethnic balance, um, you know, if, if you will. And so how, how do I um, sort of rectify the deficit that I may be experiencing through the week with, well, but this, this becomes my water, you know, my spiritual soul, my, 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 my water, that, that which, um, quenches my, my spiritual thirst, um, on, on the weekend. You know, there's this quote that's often attributed, what, to Martin Luther King Jr., that what, you know, Sunday, 11 o'clock, the most segregated hours. And I think you're right. It, it, in many ways, it continues to be. Yes, that there are some, at least within Christianity, some churches that, you know, are becoming more diverse. But I think for the most part, we, we, we still, are racially and ethnically siloed um, in our particular um, edifices. Um, I go back to exposure because I think, you know, we live in a world and we can't help but to try to understand if we're talking about executive orders that are banning Muslims from certain countries, well, our children are going to ask, well, what does that mean? You know, are all Muslims bad or, you know, what's going on? That opens the door, I think, to those interreligious conversations. Um, Our children are, are, I think, more astute than than we've come to realize. Uh, because they are saying, well, well, yeah, you know, my friend such and such, mm-hmm. you know, they don't go to church on Sunday. They're Muslims. I was like, well, I didn't know that. I said, well, yeah, mom, they are. So our children are already going to school where they are exposed to all sorts of religious and cultural and social diversity. I think sometimes as adults, we're the ones that may be lacking <laughs> in their regard. So they're sort of leading us into that. What, how do we deal with that, you know, on, on our, our, our Sabbaths, on our, our, you know, Sundays? I think it's about exposure throughout the week and having those conversations. And so, um, for example, I, I was going out to one of our students who is a Hindu student. I wanted my sons to go to that temple with me. So they went Mm -hmm. and they had the experience of seeing and, you know, of being exposed to food and and, and all that, that that involved, because I want them to be informed. I want them to learn, you know, from me. Um, So I think from a larger level, again, having taking the risk to expose, but also on a personal level, we have to realize that already in our schools, and perhaps in our daycares, our children are getting that exposure. Um, and even in, in our neighborhoods, you know, basketball teams, and sporting events, we're seeing um, ways in which there are these levels of, of difference. 
um, whether it's religious or a cultural or race or and even class. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that the more we are out in the community, the more we're listening to what's happening, I think the more we have to grapple with that, well, you know, the train has already left the station. Um, the nunners. Mm-hmm. And so we're dealing with a generation who didn't grow up in the church. Well, what does that mean um, for those of us who have grown up in the church and yet we're trying to have some conversation? What are we losing um, by not being in dialogue with these num- nunners? What are we not getting? Um, because it's something that's sort of turning them away or, you know, they're like not so sure about our religious institution. And I think if we want to grow and if we want to um, be, be really, I think, credible and really have an impact, we have to learn to listen to those who are not within our walls. Mm-hmm. So one of the things I, I think one of the uh be if people haven't ordered the book yet, which would just be ridiculous this far into an interview not to go ahead and do it. Um, Please. My favorite, my favorite chapter of the New Testament uh, one was uh, Zebedee's wife. Oh yeah. And, yeah. and and maybe you could uh, say a bit about that, and not just because. Um, it, it, look, I I'm a diehard Laker fan, and mm-hmm. I want you all to know that read this. I, we have a lot of of podcast listeners in Oklahoma, and a bunch of them. Or, or Kevin Durant fans until he mm. left to Golden State, Ooh. which so is it, Kevin Durant's mom is yeah. in the in this chapter. It's great. You remember those days when he was on your team and you teared up at the MVP? <laughs> it, like forget that he joined the guy that chews his mouthpiece and seems a little cocky, and um, unless he became a Laker, then he would be wonderful. Like you don't have to. Don't worry about that. I know there could be flashbacks for all the Oklahoma. Um, uh, listeners <laughs> talk about this, but, but I, I do think it's, it's interesting that this text, the, it's titled Zebedee's wife because she's not even named in, Absolutely. in scripture mm-hmm. while mm-hmm. the, the father and both the sons are. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. maybe you can, uh, yeah, just, just set it up. Yeah. So in, in, in Matthew uh, 20, it's a wonderful story. Um, and so, you know, Mrs. Zebedee, sort of comes. And so Jesus has been talking about kingdom, kingdom, kingdom. And I say it's a wonderful game of thrones that they uh-huh. play. Uh, because, you know, she, she plays, she's shameless about the ask. Uh, she says, well, okay, my sons are fishermen. You know, we're living in this imperial state. I'm not sure how this fishing business is going to pan out. You know, we're sort of at the bottom of the pyramid here. And you're talking about kingdom. And I think there's this kind of, you know, um, um, beta tape, iPod miscommunication that they have as it relates to kingdom. You know, she's thinking more so, you know, kingdom here and now, whereas Jesus has a kind of different understanding of kingdom. Peter and had so, a hard time following it too. So there you go. There you go. So she says, well, okay, you're talking about kingdom. I know that you're going to be in the middle. So, okay, I have two sons. How about one on the right, one on the left? And so, again, this woman negotiating kingdom, similar to Bathsheba, negotiating a kingdom on behalf of, in this case, two men, her sons. And so, well, you know, Jesus says, well, you know, it's really not mine to grant. And, you know, are you sure you can handle this? And they're like, well, yeah, we're good. We can handle this. Um, so it's, it's a wonderful, I think, um, Rick, be about the boldness of Mrs. Zebedee. And the way in which she plays this kingdom game, uh, because I think for her, the, the, the stake, uh, what's at stake are her sons and their future, their well-being. Um, we're not so sure what's going to happen under this kind of domineering, dominating structure, but I want them to have more. I want them to be better. And, you know, it's Kevin Durant. He talks about that, you know, when he was nine years old, his mom would get him and his brother up. And have them run up and down the hills, have them run up and down the street to get them ready to to exercise and so that they would be um, trained and they would be in shape. And so when he wins MVP, he says, hey, it's all about you because you did this as a single mom in our little apartment. You know, you knew what the future could be for us. You know, she played this kind of sports game. And so here's Kevin Durant making millions and millions of dollars still and What's the first thing he does? He pays homage to his mom, um, who early on saw something in him. Mm-hmm. And and I think um, you know even if uh, your mom, if your kid's not six eleven with a wonderful jump <laughs> shot, uh, parents are extremely gifted, especially moms at 
I, I think dads tend to be the ones that uh, project onto their kids exactly yeah. what they wish they were, and mm-hmm. moms are uh, tend to be the ones that uh, love their kids so much they'll mm-hmm. they're willing to look at who's really in front of them, and then see potential that you don't always see in yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And and I in in you know in one sense you get that oh you know she was there and pushing and and, and that side and the other one was like. Her sitting there and pushing was a statement of confidence about mm-hmm. the potential in her child, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and um, and and that to me is a, a you, you know like even even if and I've been a I've coached football and had moms mm-hmm. that were pretty sure that their kid mm-hmm. was going to be in the NFL even though they're ah. only seven and that they should get more <laughs> playing time. Right, and, right, right. And so right. when when I read the chapter, I thought I thought of some moms. And that uh, came up and said, hey, you know, my son has not played quarterback yet. And I said, yeah, have you seen your son? No, no, I didn't say that. Um, but uh, but there is a sense of that uh, the eyes that are attentive to who's in front of you and sees this potential and the love that's there. But also the other side is like to ex- teaching you to expect more out of yourself. Mm-hmm. Right. And then and then and working with them and stuff. So the when when you think of a, a lot of the images that come out of motherhood in here they don't line up with like cheesy mother day cards right like (laughs) in some sense the picture of the perfect mom culturally Mm -hmm. isn't the one who who's going to go like the canaanite woman and and get right up in jesus's face they're not going to be the ones like look if you're gonna kingdom there's got to be some chairs somewhere else my boys are ready to rock it you know like they're the um oh like Bathsheba uh, being figuring out how to use her agency in the middle of a, mm-hmm. a system that has violated from the very beginning. Like these mm-hmm. pictures of women in scripture don't meet the kind of passive, docile, smiling, make the best out of it, oh to be okay picture mm-hmm. that normally ends up on Hallmark cards. And so Well you know it, it it depends because here's the other thing. You know, Bathsheba I guess from our understanding of her, she still has to wrestle with her past. We we are still making Bathsheba wrestle with Bathsheba's past, right? We're going to get, you know, it's like, well, she, what she did to David, quote mm-hmm. unquote, what she did. Um, Rispa, there, there is still this kind of, well, she's, it's still, you know, patriarch that she has to deal with. And even with Mrs. Zebedee, I mean, yeah, there, there's this kind of, she's great, she's wonderful, there's the ask. But the text also says that, it's this proskuneo posture that she's groveling. She is begging, almost imagine her on her knees, pleading. And so, you know, what are the, the lengths that we mothers go through or that parents go through? The kind of proskuneo posturing, the pleading that we do on behalf of our children. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, whether it's verbal pleading, whether, you know, it, it's, it's physical or whether it's the things that we don't do that represent the kind of proskuneo, I just need you to give my child an opportunity kind of pleading. So there is the strength of Mrs. Zebedee. But yeah, the text makes it clear that there is this patriarchal context that she is she's pleading for them. And, you know, Jesus has to wrestle with that, with her pleading for them. Um, Mary is, is, she struggles. Mm -hmm. Mary is like, what do you mean I I have favor? I'm not so sure about this favor. It's an ugly scene with Jesus and the Canaanite mother. The language is horrible. It is, you know, profane, you know, even what he's, what Jesus, what Jesus what Jesus says to her and calls her. And yet she says, fine, call me what you want, say what you will, as long as in the end you heal my daughter. So I think it's also that kind of vulnerable side. Mm-hmm. That yes, we are, we are fierce and we are fearless, but it's also, these are the things, the lengths that our, we as mothers will go through, that we as parents will go to for our children because we want them to have um, that chance. We want them to have that opportunity. We want them to be made whole. We want them to be, um, to be well. Mm-hmm. And, and I think there's a, a more round picture of what mm-hmm. mothers are actually willing to do in the biblical mm-hmm. text than kind of uh, the – you know, TV version of what um, moms yeah. go through in sitcoms and, and that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And I, w- I, w- I wonder if there's a, like, 
what kind of advice for moms comes out of wrestling with these texts and in our own times? Mm. Like, what what are you hoping? Uh, and maybe like fears that sit in the minds of of people you're thinking about when you're writing, you want to kind of uh, take off their shelf and maybe uh, replace it with uh, a different picture, or a different image, or a different word. Well, I, I think it depends on the mom and it depends on the day. And I, I say that because, you know, there's some days where, you know, we are fearless like Bathsheba, that we are negotiating, we are, you know, calling the powers at, at the, you know, to be the powers that are, we're calling them, you know, on the carpet, we're saying, you know what, you've got to do something. We are, there are days in which we are shameless, like, you know, the mother of, of James and John, Mrs. Ebony, that, you know, we'll, mm-hmm. we'll do whatever um, for the sake of, of our children. So I think it depends, you know, on the day, what posture <laughs> um, that we take. Society, yes, can, can be hard. It can be difficult. There are days when we, we, we do feel beat down like the Canaanite mother that, you know what, I've been asking and pleading. And at this point, I, I really don't care what you say. But are you going to sign these papers? <laughs> are you going to let her, her into this school? You know, are you going to change this grade? Are you going to take my call so we can, we can talk about this? So I, I just think it depends on, on the day. Um, it depends on just who we're, who's in front of us and what we're experiencing. Um, for me, the point was just to show that number one, motherhood is not monolithic, mm-hmm. uh, that there are various facets, there are various, you know, aspects to it. And these aren't all. This is just, I think, a glimpse, a taste of, of what we see. I think it, it also helps us to see that motherhood, yes, it's personal and it's within our own household, but it has, it can have a larger communal, societal, mm-hmm. national impact. Um, that there's this larger calling, um, that, you know, sort of in the sense of communal mothers, you know, there were neighborhood mothers and community mothers, um, who said, well, there's something else that's also at stake here. So how can we use our, 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 our power, our prowess as mothers, um, to change this sort of national landscape? Um, in, in many regards, you know, if, if it's America, the beautiful, you know, oh, America, the great, whatever the heck it is, you know, what, how can we use our maternal power um, so that everybody is included and everybody gets to sit at the table? Um, so there are ways in which we have a sort of personal investment. But I think I want to also say, how can we have these sort of national conversations, um, you know, like with, you know, this group mob, mothers of black boys and, um, this moms, um, moms demand action. Mm-hmm. Um, so how can we connect to these larger maternal groups and, and use our voice? Uh, because there's something that we have at stake and there's, there's a bigger picture here. Um, I also want, um, really in the end for mothers to honor the work that they do, you know, to honor themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, and not to say, because I'm not working outside of the home, or because this is all I do, that it's inconsequential. It's not. Um, because I say in the beginning that a mother's voice, you know, is, is soothing. It is calming that a mother's voice can change the world. Um, that when a child hears his or her mom speaking, that can give life, that could stir something in that child. Um, it could also damage the child because many children take their sort of first glimpses of self-esteem and self-identity from their mother's voices. Mm-hmm. Um, so there, uh, you know, the idea is when mama speaks, mama can, mama can, you know, change a child's trajectory um, for good or for bad. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, I, I, I'm interested in how you, what kind of way you want to finish this conversation. Cause I have a stack of questions that didn't get to, <laughs> and sure, sure. I've, I've really, really enjoyed getting to talk to you. Um, and you know, I, 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 you tell me what, what kind of thoughts or things are sitting in your head you haven't said. Um, because a lot of people will be listening to this and to come out as people are, uh, you know, uh, Mother's Day is on their mind. Mm-hmm. And, uh, um, yeah. I think, you know, I, I, I lift that, um, it, Mother's Day can be difficult. Um, and so I think we, we glorify it. Um, and, and we give honor to moms and we get the flowers and the candies and, you know, mothers don't have to cook and that's great. But I think, you know, the edgy person that I am, well, let's talk about, you know, women for who've lost their moms mm-hmm. or let's think about those women who are incarcerated, who won't get to see their children. 
Um, let's think about, you know, those mothers who are displaced, um, those mothers who are fearing deportation, um, or those mothers who are making that track before this quote unquote wall gets built um, here in the United States. You know, moms for him, for whom Mother's Day is, is difficult. Um, the first line in the book for me is, you know, I dedicated the book to my own mom who committed suicide. Um, so for some mothers and Mother's Day and mothering can be a challenge. So how do we keep um, those aspects of motherhood in mind? And also keeping in mind that whether we are a mother, you know, biologically or not, there are ways in which we can all nurture and support and, and love and care um, for each, each other. There's a little, I think, mothering in, in all of us. And how do we tap into that? Uh, yes, for the sake of ourselves, our families, our communities, our societies, and, um, for the sake of this nation, but for the sake of this world as well. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk. And uh, I'm, I was just excited um, to do this. And I hope everyone uh, goes and checks out When Mama Speaks. Uh, the book is available, all cool places, books. Mm-hmm. And, and um, yeah, and maybe you want to say just a bit about where you are and how people can connect with you in Chicago. Sure. I uh, was just um, promoted to associate professor at the Chicago Theological Seminary. So I'm very excited about that. Um, so, you know, people can email me there at SB as in boy, SB Crowder at CTS Chicago of dot edu. And so um, would love to have some conversation or get some emails about the book. Would love to have some feedback. Um, people have called for a part two. <laughs> so we are in, in prayer about that and the time and the space and uh, the energy uh, to, to, let me say, give birth, if you will, mm-hmm. for maternal image uh, to a part two. So people can reach me at Chicago Theological Seminary. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you, Tripp, for the time. And it's been a, just a sheer joy talking with you. Awesome. Well, I hope you have a great afternoon. Absolutely. You too. Thank you so much. <laughs>